ماشاءاللہ لا حول ولا قوت الا بالله العلی العظیم حسبنا الله ونعم الوکیل نعم المولا ونعم النصیر ربی شرح لی صدری ویسل لی امری وحل العقد تم اللسانی یفقه قولی اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ قاسم الجبارین مبیر الظالمین مدرک الحاربین وصلاة والسلام وتحیت والاکرام على النبی الامی المکی المدنی الحاشمی الذي سمی فی السماوات بحمد وفی الارضین بأبی القاسم محمد اللہم صلی على محمد و آن محمد و على اہل بیته الاطیبین الاطحرین سیما اولہم امیر المؤمنین و آخرہم بقیت اللہ فی الارضین روحی و ارواح العالمین لتراب مقدمه الفداء و رحمت اللہ على محبیہم و موالیہم و شیعتہم مجمعین و لعنت اللہ على عدائہم ملعنین اما بعد All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is Ahman and the one who is Rahim. We have reached the night of Ashura, the night of Tasu'ai Husseini. Tomorrow is the day of Ashura. the day of great Musiba, the, the day of great sorrow for the believers. It is mustahab, highly recommended that a person stay awake tonight, ahya in this night, to stay awake until the time of Fajr in the way that Aba Abdullah and his companions also did. They spent this whole night in worship, and so it is mustahab that one spends this night also in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was this night where the hope to meet with Allah was fortified. Sayyidul Shuhada told them that tomorrow is the day. This night that Sayyidul Shuhada had gained because the army of Yazid had wanted to start the battle today. And it was Sayyidul Shuhada that sent Abu Fadl al Abbas towards Umar ibn Sa'ad, saying to them, Abbas, go ask for one more night. Why? Inni uhibbu salah because I love praying, I love my salah. Let me spend this one last night praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was that hope of Aba Abdullah, the hope of the companions of Aba Abdullah, their trust in their Imam, their staunchness in front of the enemy the adherence to the religion of Allah and protecting the religion and the sunnah of the Holy Prophet. Our discussions have been centered around this idea of hope. And we've said that hope requires four main criterions to be real hope. A person needs four types of knowledge, the knowledge of God, and we said it's not philosophical. Rather, it is to understand that God would never do wrong by us. To understand that God is Qadir. He is the very same God that would give Musa in an instant the power to split the Nile. And he is the very same God that would defend the honor of Maryam through the mouth of a baby. And he is the very same God that would defend his prophet hiding in the cave with a web on the outside of it. That God that possesses all of that power, he will never let me and you go down 
a path where it would be said that he has done dhulm on us. It is me and you that he loves the most and wants us to ascend higher than the angels, not lower than the cattle. The second essential knowledge that we discussed over the last three nights was the knowledge of the self. What is my ability? What am I able to do? How do I differentiate between false hope and true hope? The different types of hopes I have in my life where I attach to people or my job or my career progression. Is that hope true hope or is it false hope? Is it the mirage or is it truly raja? Is it truly hope that is tempered through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then today we will begin the discussion on the dunya and the akhirah. And it will complete on the Soyan Majlis where we will look specifically at the day of Qiyamah and how the Shifa'ah of Ahlul Bayt works. We always hear that they will be our Shafi'ah. They will be uh, the ones that intercede for us. So inshallah we'll look at the Riwayat on the 12th as to what it is or what in what shape does the Shifa'a of Ahlul Bayt take on Yawm al The dunya and Qiyamah are two things that if a person was to truly understand them and comprehend them and rationalize them, they would never despair within their life. Never despair within their life. Even if they were weak in their own ability or even if they were weak in their understanding of God. If they were able to understand this dunya and qiyamah, they would never despair. Because understanding the dunya and understanding yawm al-qiyamah, it expands the horizons of a person. You know, we are so mahdud, we are so restricted in how we view things. For example, a loved one dies... And we say to us, we say, you know, why is it that God did that? That's the extent of our vision. You know, because we haven't understood the dunya. We haven't understood the qiyamah. You know, all of these difficulties that are going around the world right now with COVID and the fear that people have of this virus. You know, I'm not saying don't take precautions and don't, but there are some people that have a genuine fear and that fear is because they don't have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they haven't understood the relationship of the dunya with the akhirah. They have done everything for the sake of this dunya. Now to get a virus, to fall ill, to maybe die is a scary prospect for them. That's not to say that a person doesn't take precautions, but there are those that have gone over and beyond uh, precautionary measures. There are those that have been consumed by fear and that fear has crippled them and stopped them from progressing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forget progressing in the dunya, but actually they themselves progressing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our mahdud, our restricted vision stops us from being able to see the reality that awaits us. That same loved one that died, if I had the vision or I had the understanding of what the Akhirah is, I wouldn't say why, rather I would look towards the life of the Barzakh and if Allah had granted me that, I would understand and I would know that this person was a good person and here they sat with the awliya of Allah in gardens, in palaces, in mansions through ease. If I had that vision, or for example, illness, you know, we, we look at illness and it's like, it's the end of my life. I don't know how I'm going to you know, take even COVID. You know, I don't want to catch it. If I catch it, you know, what's going to happen or a person that's got a chronic illness. But if we looked at the illness that we had and we were, you know, how people complain about how they were ill. 
But if we understood the dunya and the akhirah, we'd know that the dunya is temporary and the akhirah is permanent. The pain of the dunya is temporary, but the life of the akhirah is eternal. We would know that sin is wiped away through illness. And so the sin that we have accumulated over our lives living within this world, every time we fall in, that's a penance for ill, that's a penance for our sins. So when those sins are forgiven, now when we enter into the Akhirah, it's easy. Because the dunya is just mahdud. The dunya is something that is just restricted. Our vision is restricted. The dunya itself is based on time. It will naturally, it's made to be destroyed. Say the Shuhada in the letter that he writes from Karbala, there's one letter that he writes to Muhammad Hanafiya and the youth of Bani Hashim that remain in Medina. He says, from Hussein ibn Ali to his brother Muhammad Hanafiya and the remaining members of the tribe of Bani Hashim, you should know, dunya lam takun, wa al-akhira lam tazal. Wassalamu alaikum. That is the last letter that Imam Hussein sends from Karbala. You, Bani Hashim, should know that the dunya is something that is temporary and will be and it's been made to be destroyed, and the akhirah is the thing that shall remain. So when a person is ill in this dunya and they have that basira, they have that understanding of the dunya and the akhirah, they'll look towards this illness and know that it is a penance for their sin. For this reason, we've been told to uh, constantly recite the dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina adhab al-nar. We're asking Allah for good in this dunya and good in the akhirah. The Holy Prophet would constantly recite this at the time of subh, at the time uh, uh, of fajr. He would recite this dua constantly. It's been recommended that a person that is ill recites this dua over and over in order to gain Shifa. Imam Sadiq salam, when talking about this dua, he says that there are four things that a person is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for in this dua. He says when he's asking for hasana, good within the dunya, he's asking for two things. And good within the akhirah, he's asking for two things. For the dunya, he's asking for ma'ash, he's asking for rizq, increase in his rizq. His wealth, food, clothing, all of these things, his health, this is risk. The second, he says, is husnul khulq, good akhlaq, good morals. This is what the person is asking for. And when it comes to the akhirah, the two things that he's asking for is the ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him. And the second is jannah. So the one that constantly recites this will have both dunya and akhirah. Islam doesn't allow a person to forsake the dunya for the akhirah, nor does it allow a person to forsake the akhirah for the dunya. You know, the akhirah for the dunya is easy. People are absorbed within this world. But no, Islam goes one step further. It says, no, you cannot forsake this dunya for the akhirah. You can't go and live in a cave like a monk for the sake of the akhirah. Surah Al-Qasas, verse number 77, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَابْتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهِ دَارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَسِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا He says, and seek by means of what Allah has given you, your akhirah, your future abode. So work towards the akhirah. This is something we always hear. Akhirah, akhirah, akhirah. But the remaining part of the ayah, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا And do not neglect your portion of this world. It means what? It means that we can't go and live in a cave like monks or in a monastery, like monks withdrawing from the world, constantly just worshipping, worshipping, worshipping. Because a person has to live within the dunya, the dunya's trials, helping other people, all of these things form part of that progression of the human being. Many of the early Muslims got the wrong end of the stick when it came to uh, Zuhd, asceticism. They went and started, they left their families, they went and they started living up in the uh, the mountains, in the caves, and Rasulullah had to call them all back. Said, look, I'm the prophet of God. I get married, I spend time with my family, I live within, it's not allowed for you to 
go and disappear into the uh, caves. So, but on the flip side, you know, it's not allowed for a person to forget their akhara and totally drown themselves in the dunya, because forgetting the akhara would leave uh, would leads to people like Fir'aun, Yazid, Umar ibn Sa'ad, you know, all of these different people that were obsessed with the life of the dunya. And when we talk about the life of the dunya, the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Hadid lists five phases of the human being's life. It says, uh, أَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبْ وَاللَّهَبْ وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرُوا بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرُوا فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ It says five things. Know that the life of this world is only sport, play, uh, beautification, boasting amongst yourselves, and vying f uh, in the multiplication of wealth and children. Now, when you go to the riwayat, they said these are the five stages of insan within this world. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about it negatively. That the insan, the man that is uh, forgetful of his akhirah, he lives his life like this. Sport, yeah, this is according to riwayat, up until the age of eight. Yeah, Play is until the age of 16, you know, sporting when they're young, you know, toys here, there, play, I'm now distracted by other activities, you know, the third phase until the age of 24 is the age of beautification, now a person wants to look good, smell nice, wear good clothes, fashionable, you know, uh, and then the next stage is the one of uh, beautification, and that's until the age of 32. Here a person, uh, sorry, is the phase of boasting. Now a person is saying, I've got this car, I've got this house, I made this much, I, you know, wear these clothes. It's the age of boasting, tafakhur. And then the last phase, which is 40 plus, is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the human being is worried about multiplying his wealth and, uh, and having children. You know, and he busies himself in that. And if a person does only these five, then he's condemned. You know, his life in this dunya is wasted. It's essential for every human being to utilize every one of these stages in order to better themselves. When we're younger, that's the role of the parents, to try and mold a child so that those early years are not just sport and play, but rather alongside that, we teach them how to recite Qur'an, we get them to memorize Qur'an, we give them good akhlaq, you know, all of these things, so that they know how to act, they know, and we instill that relationship between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a love for the religion, a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we don't, then a person is condemned, then a person cannot... Uh, leave this dunya successfully you know the human beings are of three types in this world you know there is uh, the first type that I like to call the chameleon or the influenced you know whoever he or she comes into contact with they become like them so if with the, they're with the good they're good uh, or if they're with the bad they're bad if they're with the ugly they're ugly you know, they have no moral compass. It's whichever way the wind blows, that's the way that they turn. You know, there's no staunchness within them. Najashi was one of the poets of Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. Was one of the Shias of Amir al-Mu'mineen as well. And would recite poems uh, in the madh, in the praise of Amir al-Mu'mineen. One day during Shah Ramadan, he was on the way to the masjid and he meets an old friend and his friend says, oh, where are you going? He says, oh, I'm going to pray namaz in the masjid. Friend says, look, you've got loads of time to namaz yet. Come, why don't we go back to my house? We'll sit down and, you know, uh, catch up. So he says, okay, fine. So he goes to his house and uh, 
as they walk in, he sees that there's food laid out. And so Najashi looks at his friend and says to him, are you not fasting? He says, look, you know, you to your religion, me to mine, it doesn't matter, you know, like, uh, I'm not. You know, so Najashi, he sits down with him, they talk, they talk, they talk. Eventually this friend starts to offer him food and he's like, no, I'm fasting. And he's like, look, what does it matter? Allah is merciful. He knows, eat, you know, the heat of Kufa, all of these things Najashi eats. He breaks his fast, he eats, carries on, carries on, and his friend now brings alcohol. Najashi drinks the alcohol, becomes drunk, leaves his house, and the people find him and they capture him, they take him to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ali, he was drunk. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, at that point, passes the judgment of a hundred lashes. Eighty for the drinking, and 20 because it was done in Shah Ramadan. That night, the tribe and the family of Najashi come to Amir al and say, Ya Ali, look, he's one of your lovers. He made a mistake. You know, just let him go, please. You know, uh, just let him go. Because if you administer the punishment on him, he's going to leave you and he's going to go and join Muawiyah. And at that point, Amir al Mu'minin says to them, he says, look, I can't change the hudud of Allah, the the... Uh, the rules and the criteria set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next day, the punishment is administered and Najashi indeed runs away. He runs and he goes to and joins with Muawiyah. Although he does say one good thing when he reaches Muawiyah. Muawiyah says to him, where are you coming from? He says, I'm fleeing from the justice of Ali ibn Abi Talib in order to take refuge in your oppression." So the first group of human beings in the dunya is the one that is influenced. You know, uh, Sayyidu Shahda says in Karbala, says, Anas abid dunya wa deen la'ikun ala al sinatihim. Says, man is a slave of this world and the dunya is but a, t- uh, the religion is but a taste on their tongue. When it suits them, they're religious. But when they're tested with bala, with difficulties, then very few of them remain religious. This is that individual that is influenced. You know, whatever, wherever the, um, you know, the, the wind blows, they're going. They have no backbone. These are individuals that look to water down the hudud of Allah. What, what difference does it make, you know, if I pray half an hour before or half an hour after? You know, as long God knows my intention, at least I'm pure in my intention to pray to Him. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, God knows my intention, my heart is pure, so what if I don't wear hijab? Or God is uh, knows my intention, so what if I listen to music? At least I don't go out and do that. The, the comparison, you know, we do this constantly. There's this comparison of sin to project. Remember in the first lecture, I said that despair is caused by constantly projecting my issues on someone else, you know, trying to divert the attention away from me and my uh, problems. This is why Sayyidina Shuhada says, An-Nas, Abidu dunya wa deen la'ikun ala al-sinatihim. It's just a taste on their tongue. Suits them, they keep it. Doesn't suit them, then, you know, slowly, slowly, they start watering it down. Things don't go their way. You know, the, the waswasa of shaitan starts coming in. Man, you're so good looking. You know, this these type of clothing that you're wearing, you know, brother, it's not making you look good. All of that working out that you're doing, you know, shirt's got to be a little bit tighter. At least people can see then, you know, the work that you've been putting in. See, that's the problem. That's the waswasa of shaitan that tries and... Uh, takes a person away and then the influenced person straight away spit away the religion and go with wherever shaitan is telling them to go that's the first group. the second group are the individuals that are steadfast they're not influenced by other people they're not uh, moved away from the truth they're steadfast on it uh, they remain upon the religion but 
you know, it's restricted to themselves. You know, it's good. You know, they literally take the ayakum and fusukum wa ahlikum nara from the Holy Quran, save yourself and your family from the fire of hell, literally. And that's all they're concerned about. They worry about themselves and, you know, and to some extent that is good. They focus on themselves, prepare themselves, stay away from haram, no matter what gathering they go into. They're not influenced. If they end up going to a gathering, for example, a wedding, and then you know they believe these people to be Shia and uh, you know mu'minin, and they start playing music or stuff for Allah, that person will get up and leave. Yeah. So this is the second group, which are steadfast, and they're good. But the third group are the best of all three of these. And that is the group that doesn't get influenced, remains steadfast, and instead becomes an influencer upon others. It tries to, uh, that person then tries to guide other people. In Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 110, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls that uh, those group of people khayra uh, ummatin, the best of ummas, the best of people. Yeah, the ayah 110 of Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas, ta'muruna bil ma'roof, wa tanhawna alin munkar, wa tu'minu billah, wa tu'minuna billah. He says, you're the best of nations, raised up for the benefit of men. What do they do? They enjoin what is right, they forbid what is wrong, and they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're the best of nations. Those are the type of people that are sitting in that gathering and the music is being started to play. They get up and they actually go and say, you know, this isn't right, we shouldn't have this. Whether the people listen or not, you know, they do their amr bil ma'roof and nahi alin munkar. And this is the whole point that Sayyidu Shuhada left. Uh, Medina. When I left to the طلب الإصلاح في أمة جدي أريد أن أمر بالمعروف وعنها عن المنكر that I've left in order to reform the Ummah of my grandfather in order to enjoin good and forbid evil. Now that was the whole purpose. So group two and three are good: the staunch and the influencers. But the best is the person that is staunch and also does. Um, Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar. They enjoy good, they forbid the evil. They don't forsake their dunya for their akhirah or their akhirah for the dunya, but they understand that this dunya is mazra'atul akhirah. This dunya is a bridge to the akhirah. This dunya is a garden for the akhirah. You know, the narration says dunya is a garden. So uh, what you want for your akhirah here and reap it in the akhirah. He says it's a dunya is a bridge to the akhirah. Don't, you know, set up your houses on the bridge. Don't get ready. Just use it to go towards the akhirah. And Karbala has examples of these uh, on both sides. You know, people who were influenced, people who were influencers, you know, people who um stayed staunch that they then didn't go out uh and do amr bil ma'ruf but they remained staunch they didn't go against the order of allah many of the people that remained in in medina for example they were good people but they didn't come out to do that amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar with aba abdullah even many of the bani hashim but then there were those that was staunch and they came out to do that Amr bil Ma'roof uh, with Aba Abdullah. On the opposite side were those that chose the dunya. Ubaidullah Hurra Jofi, for example, an individual who Aba Abdullah himself goes to visit. He says, I know you weren't with my father Ali. I know that you were against my brother Hassan, but I'm giving you an opportunity. If you join us, I will guarantee you the shifa of my grandfather on Yawm al Qiyamah. He says, Oh, you know, Imam, I've got family, I've got this. Imam says, We'll take care of all of that. 
He says, look, I can't come. Here's my spear, you know, my sword, shield, horse. They're all for you. They're the best. Abu Abdullah says, we don't need any of this. We need you. He says, then I can't come. And after the event of Ashura, he's seen walking through the bodies, you know, reciting poetry, Awaydullah, until you are alive, mourn that you did not help the son of Zahra when he came to you. So these are those type of... The Kufans in Kufa that gave bay'ah to Yazid, uh, gave bay'ah to Hazrat Muslim and then turned back. You know, when Ibn Ziyad comes, he knows the exact price of the Kufans. The narration say he says, okay, for Fulan, give him this many dirham. Fulan, give him this many dinar. Fulan, he knew the price of all of them and bought every single one of them. Umar ibn Sa'ad, his price was the governorship of Ray. When Abu Abdullah goes to visit him, you know, and they say, you know, come uh, towards the truth and leave this. He says, oh no, I've got family, they'll kill them. He says, we'll take care of them. I've got a house in Kufa. He says, we'll give you another house in Medina. He says, I've got this. Got this. Abu Abdullah says, we'll take care of everything. He says, oh, but they've offered me the governorship of Ray. And Abu Abdullah says, he can't offer you any governorship. These people chose the dunya over their akhirah. But then there are those that utilize this dunya by being by the side of Abu Abdullah to reach the akhirah. Those who zahiran would have gone to hell because they were on the opposite side. Take for example Har comes to Abu Abdullah and now Hur, as I said yesterday, is Rahmatullah Ali. But even then Hur comes on Subhi Ashur, joins with Abu Abdullah and becomes Rahmatullah Ali. But there are those that came even after Hur. In fact, there are those that came when everyone had gone, at the last moment when Abu Abdullah had lost every single one and he stood there and for the last time called out Hal min nasirin yansuruna Ali Asghar has gone as well. Two brothers looked at each other. Sa'ad ibn Harith and Hutuf ibn Harith. They looked at each other and said, what have we done? They came riding across to Abu Abdullah. Ibn Rasulillah. We stood by while they killed your Abbas. We stood by and watched while they killed your Qasim. We stood by as Aun and Muhammad and all of your companions were killed. Ya Abu Abdullah, is there any forgiveness for us? Remember, they're not these two individuals are not just in the army of Yazid, but they were also part of the Khawarij in Nahrawan. That's fought against Amir al-Mu'mineen, that uh, revolted against Amir al-Mu'mineen after Sifin, and then went to Nahrawan, and then started uh, killing people in Nahrawan, then Amir al-Mu'mineen went and he killed the people there. And it was one of the most bloodiest battles, and I'll say this here, that it was one of the most bloodiest battles of the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen, that he himself says in Nahj al I went and I ripped out the eye of the fitna, from the tens of thousands that were there, only a handful remained. From that handful, these two brothers are there in Karbala. Now you understand why he was saying to Malik al-Ashtar that Malik, me striking someone and you striking someone is different because I look down their lineage. If there is even one mu'min in their line, I spare them. These two brothers spared are amongst the handful that are saved in Nahrawan, that are not killed by Amir al Mu'mineen. But yet, you see why, because in Karbala, they come to Abi Abdullah just before Asri Ashur. Ya Aba Abdullah, we watched everything happen. Hadli min Toba, is there any forgiveness for us? Aba Abdullah looks at them, says that now that you have come, towards Hussein. Look, their time is so so much less than Hur. There's no time for istighfar. Just in a moment, they joined themselves with Abba Abdullah. They did their istighfar. And today, their names are written on the dharih 
of Aba Abdullah. When you go to Karbala, their names are inscribed there. And today you remember them and you say Rahmatullah alayh because they connected to Aba Abdullah. Use this dunya in order to achieve their akhirah. This is Hussein ibn Ali. Understand the dunya. Understand the purpose of the dunya. Understand why it is that this dunya was created. And you will, you will instantly have hope. You will fight off despair. You will never despair. And especially if you are joined and hold on to the door of Aba Abdullah. In Al Hussein, Misba al Huda wa Safina tul Naja. Hussein is the lantern of guidance, the ark of salvation. Imam al Radha says his ark is faster and more wider can take a lot more people towards salvation. On this night of Ashura, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turn to Aba Abdullah, and ask that, O oh Allah, for the sake of Aba Abdullah, reform me in the way that Aba Abdullah wanted, O oh Allah, make me like the companions of Aba Abdullah for the sake so that I can be by the side of my Imam. This night of Ashura, Aba Abdullah gathered all the companions. He brought them all together and you hear, he said, I've lifted my bay'ah from all of you. He says, those of you that want to leave have permission to leave. All of you go. Take one member of my family with you. But there was one thing that Abba Abdullah said in that statement said, all of you go, all of you take a member of my family with you. But the only one that should remain is my son Ali Akbar. How dear was Ali to Abba Abdullah? An eldest son is the support of his father. He says, all of you can go. The only person that should remain as part or whose oath is not lifted is my son Ali Akbar. Ali was so dear to Sayyidu Shahada, was so dear to Abu Abdullah. But yet, when the day of Ashura dawns and all of the companions go, and Ali Akbar comes towards his father, Father, give me permission to go out and fight. Give me permission to go and give my life in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say Abu Abdullah gave Ali Akbar permission straight away. But the Maqatil say that although Hussein gave permission to Ali Akbar straight away, فَنَظَرَ آئِسٍ مِّنْهِ But he looked towards Ali Akbar with sorrow in his eyes, with tears in his eyes. He prepares Ali himself. He puts the armor on his body. He wraps the amama around his head. He helps him mount upon the horse. Ali Akbar begins to ride out. As he's riding out, he hears someone running and stumbling behind him. 
He turns around. He sees his elderly father. Slowly, slowly, oh my son. Keep on turning back. Let me see you one last time. Ali, let your father see you one last time. They say Abu Abdullah held on to his beard. He looked towards uh, the heavens. Oh Allah, bear witness uh, that this man, that this boy, this youth, that this nation fights against uh, was that one that would resemble your prophet. Every time I wanted to do the ziyarat of your Prophet, I would look towards this son of mine. Then he shouts out towards the army of Yazid. He looks towards uh, Umar ibn Sa'd. He says, Oh Umar ibn Sa'd, Qata'allahu rahimak kama qata'at rahimi. Oh Umar ibn Sa'd, may Allah cut off your lineage like you intend to cut off my lineage. Uh, Ali Akbar goes out, he's fighting. Abu Abdullah stands by the tents watching the battle of his son Ali. Layla inside the tents watching the battle of Ali through the facial expressions of Abu Abdullah. Whenever Abu Abdullah was happy, she knew that her son Ali was okay. But whenever his face became worried, she would know that Ali was in trouble. They say at one point, when worry set upon the face of Abu Abdullah, Layla called out. She said, oh, Abu Abdullah, is my son Ali okay? She says, he, he says to her that Layla, Ali is still alive, but he is going against a strong opponent by the name of Bakr ibn al -Ghanim. Oh Layla, Allah never returns. Allah never rejects the dua of a mother. Layla, go and do dua for your son Ali. They say Layla went towards her musalla. She sat down. She opened her hair. She looked towards the heavens. She began her dua. What is the dua of Layla? Ilahi. إلهي بعطش أبي عبد الله إلهي بغربة أبي عبد الله يا راد يوسف إلى يعقوب يا راد موسى إلى أمه أردد إلي ولدي علي she says oh Allah for the sake of the thirst of Abu Abdullah oh Allah for the sake of the loneliness of Abu Abdullah oh the one that returned Yusuf back to Yaqub Oh, the one that returned Musa back to his mother. Return my son Ali back to me. They say that Ali kills Bakr ibn al -Ghanim. He turns around one last time and heads towards the tents where his father is standing. Abu Abdullah looks towards his son. Hope in his eyes. Happiness in his eyes. His son returning towards him. But then... His son asks him a question that breaks the heart of Abi Abdullah. No matter how old a son becomes, in this case Ali Akbar, 24, returns towards his father. No matter how old a son becomes, but when he asks the father for something, the father will do everything in his power in order to fulfill it. But imagine that when the father is unable to fulfill something, it breaks the heart of a father, especially when the son is in need, the child is in grave need of that thing. And imagine now that that thing that the child asks for is something as simple as water. Ali Akbar returns back to Abu Abdullah. Ya Abata, al-Atash qad qatalani wa thiql al-Hadid qad aj'adani halli sharbat al-ma. Says, oh father, the thirst is killing me. The weight of the armor is taking the strength from my body. Father, is there not a drop of water? Abba Abdullah looks towards his son Ali. He says, Ali, there is no water. Ali, come close to me. According to some narrations, he says he takes Ali Akbar. He says, Ali, put your tongue on my tongue. Maybe there's some moisture on my tongue, Ali.
Maybe that would be of some use to you. As soon as Ali Akbar puts his tongue on the tongue of Abba Abdullah, they say Ali pulls back his tongue. He says, Father, your tongue is drier than mine. Abba Abdullah says to him, Ya Ali, Isbar Qadil. Oh, my son Ali, be patient for a short while. Soon you will be drinking from the pool of Kothar from the hand of your grandfather, after which you will feel no thirst, Ali, before you go out to go and see your mother. They say Ali Akbar enters into the tents of Layla, Layla unconscious on the ground. He goes towards her, he takes his uh, mother's head, he places it in his lap. Some of the sweat or the blood of the head of Ali falls upon the face of Layla. She opens her eyes. Ahlan bika ya noora aini. Oh, welcome, oh, the light of my eyes. Ali Akbar looks towards says, Mother, ma hadhal jaza wa ma hadhal buka. Mother, what is this wailing? What is this mourning? What is this crying? Mother, look at all of these other women that have given their sons, that are willing to give their sons their brothers and their husbands in the way of Allah. Mother, don't you want to stand in front of Fatima to Zahra on Yawmul Qiyamah and say to them that, O oh, Fatima, I gave my son Ali for your son Hussein. She says to him, Ali, go. I've given you permission. Go out and fight. Ali Akbar mounts upon his horse. He rides out for the last time. He begins to fight bravely. But at one point, they surround Ali from all four sides. One Malone comes from the back. He strikes Ali on the the head with such a force that Ali falls forward on his horse. The, he holds on to the neck of the horse, willing it to return back to the tents. But they say the blood from the head of Ali went into the eye of the horse. The horse disorientated, not knowing where to go. Instead, it turns in towards the army. And now as the horse runs towards the army of Yazid, whoever had a sword in their hand, they struck him his body. Whoever had a spear, they struck his body. The Ali Akbar at the Maqatil say, فَقَطَّعُوهُ إِرَبًا إِرَبًا They mutilated the body of Ali. They ripped shreds from the body of Ali. Ali Akbar no longer can hold himself on the horse. He falls to the ground. He calls out, يَا أَبَتَا عَلَيْكَ مِنِّي salam. Oh my father, Accept my final salams. Abba Abdullah Sukina, Sukina narrates, she says that when my brother Ali called out, I saw the color drain from my father's face. It was as if his soul was leaving his body. He says, my father turned and ran back towards the tents. I said to him, father, the cry of Ali came from the battlefield. Where are you going? He said, do not blame me since Ali fell from the horse darkness has come in front of the eyes of Ali of Hussein they say Abba Abdullah some say Abba Abdullah crawled to the body of Ali saying Ali where are you Ya Ali Ya Ali not knowing whether he was calling his son Ali or his father Ali in Najaf some say he ran and he fell. Others say he rode upon his horse. Regardless of how he reaches the body of his son Ali Akbar, all of the narrations say the same thing. Abba Abdullah throws himself on the body of his son. He throws himself on the body of Ali Akbar. He wipes away the dirt from the cheeks of Ali. He wipes away the blood from the teeth of his son Ali. He places his cheek on the cheek of Ali Akbar. He cries out, Oh Ali, may Allah kill that nation that killed you. Oh, may Allah reduce their numbers. Ya Ali, ala dunya ba'dik al-afa. Ali, what pleasure is there left in this dunya after you? Laqad istarahta min hamma dunya wa ghammiha. 
وأبوك وحيدا فريدا علي you have left this world and you have left all of its sorrows behind but Ali look at your father having to face all of these difficulties alone they say that Aba Abdullah فبكى الحسين بكاء شديدا Hussein cried loudly was he lie there next to the body of his son Ali they say but then all of a sudden Hussein fell silent we thought that Hussein had died having lost his beloved son Hussein had died who is there that will console Hussein who is there that will give us uh, give solace to the heart of Abi Abdullah they say that we saw a lady dressed in black come running from the tents she ran towards Abba Abdullah oh the son of my brother oh my brother Hussein accept the condolences of Zainab Abba Abdullah looks up towards Zainab he says to her Zainab not while I'm alive he takes his sister back towards the tent Abi Abdullah takes off his Abba he hands it to the youth of Bani Hashem he says oh youth of Bani Hashem go bring your brother's body back why is it that Abba Abdullah did not bring the body himself they say that the first reason could be that it's because he was returning Zainab back to the tents the second reason could be how is it that an elderly father could lift up the body of his youthful son they say the third reason and the most likely reason and the reason for why Abba Abdullah gave his Abba to the youth of Bani Hashim that because the Maqatil say فَقَدْتَعُوهُ إِرَبَ الْإِرَبَ The Ali Akbar's body was not in a state for one person to lift rather the Abba was the only way to bring the body back in order to maintain the integrity of the body so such was the mutilation that had occurred. Ala la anatullah ala al qawm al zalimin. Wasiya alamu al ladina zalamu ayyamun qalabin al qalibun. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night of Ashura, Ya Allah, forgive the sins of our parents. Ya Allah, those of our parents that are alive, give them long lives. Those of our parents that have left this world, give them a place of Ali Muhammad in Jannah. Ya Allah, for the sake of Ali Akbar, allow all of our youths to embody the khulq of Ali Akbar, the akhlaq of Ali Akbar the characteristics of Ali Akbar. Ya Allah, those who are ill, give them shifa. Those who are in debt, clear their debts. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time. Allow us to be amongst his true mantidhirin, his true waiters, for the acceptance of these du'as and any other du'as that the brothers and sisters have brought on this night. Please recite three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Hussain, Hussain, Hussain.